afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to today's present presentation, Why Financial Inclusion Matters with the YWCA of Metropolitan Chicago and J.P. Morgan Chase. I am Alexandria Cummings, and I am the Director of Financial Inclusion for the YWCA of Metropolitan Chicago. And um, so for the, we're going to be together for about 45 minutes, and it's really going to be an exciting and thoughtful and intentional time together. So while we go through the welcome, if you can make sure that you are um, tagging us in your Facebook posts, uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, wherever you are, um, and inviting others to join the conversation today. Um, this event is a four-part series, um, and so you can uh, join the conversation with us every month. Of course, today we'll be together again on November 12th, and then in December and January. The sessions that are coming up are addressing unemployment through workforce innovation. We're going to talk about coronavirus and also how uh, the pandemic has affected the job market, but also practical tools for getting people back to work and building their careers. We're also going to talk about in December, December home ownership and homelessness prevention, and that will be on Tuesday, December 15th, and then we will end uh, our series uh, with a bang in the new year, thinking about entrepreneurship amidst COVID, ways that people can continue to grow their income streams um, despite the pandemic that's going on. Um, you can register for all of these events at ywcachicago.org slash building black wealth. Again, ywcachicago.org, Building Black Wealth. And the link uh, for the registration will be up in the chat. So you can multitask and listen to us and make sure that you register for the upcoming series. Um, also, uh, we wanna continue the conversation after today. Make sure that you are following us on all of our social media channels. We are at YWCA Chicago. And just a couple more, um, uh, housekeeping items before I bring on our speakers. And if you don't mind, I'm going to use my notes a little bit. Um, our first speaker is Tosh Ernest, and she is the head of wealth for Advancing Black Pathways, which is a J.P. Morgan Chase initiative that you're going to hear a little bit more about on today's call. Uh, this initiative is designed to have a sustainable impact on the economic success and empowerment of Black communities. Tosh is responsible for, hey Tosh, <laughs> Tosh is responsible for deploying and sustaining the portfolio of inclusion programs and content in the community and across the bank for various business units. So Tosh, welcome. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about her. Not only is she doing all of these amazing things for advancing Black Pathways at Chase, Tosh outside of her work, I don't know where she has the time. She is the co-founder of Impact NYC, which is a nonprofit volunteering service that matches professional resumes uh, to nonprofits so that they can do pro bono work. So thank you, Tosh, for joining us today. We are eager to hear um, what you'll share. Thank you guys for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. Yes, and Tosh is joining us live from New York. Yes. Now <laughs> it's right live from New York. It's Friday afternoon. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have Robert Johnson, uh, who is also another panelist today. Uh, Robert is there. He is Robert looking sharp. Yes, we're excited to have you. So Robert is the chief economic inclusion officer and general counsel for YWCA Metropolitan Chicago. So Robert's role is to manage all of the economic inclusion work here at the YWCA Chicago, including workforce innovation, entrepreneurship, technology, and financial inclusion, y'all. So he's my boss. So make sure you all are uh, sending up all the, all the good chats and posting it. You all make me look good today, all right? Okay. Um, you, also, <laughs> and listen, you all, we are talking about, um, you know, a very serious topic today, why, why inclusion matters, right? But we also want to be, you know, energetic with this. So I'm going to bring the energy, you know, while we do this. And I know Tosh and Robert are going to, too. Um, but if I may, let me tell you one more thing about Robert. In addition to the amazing work 
that he does at YWCA, leading our economic empowerment. He's also, as he calls himself, a lawpreneur, right? A lawyer and entrepreneur. He is managing partner of the Solomon Group, a social enterprise management consulting firm, and they provide business management, leadership development, and access to capital for minority businesses. So you all got two of the best and the blackest financial and economic empowerment experts across the country today. So make sure that you all are sharing it. Um, and we'll also put up the link um, later for you to ask your questions about the initiative to Tosh and Robert. You all ready? Okay, okay so let's, Let's start the conversation. So Tosh, you are up first. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, Chase, JP Morgan Chase's Advancing Black Pathways initiative. Absolutely. So JP Morgan Chase created the Advancing Black Pathways program to invest in black individuals, families and businesses so that they can fully share in the economic growth of America. So we're hiring black talent, developing Black leadership and investing in Black businesses and households to improve the financial health of Black communities around the world. And we are focusing on the key areas in which Black people have historically trailed other groups around wealth creation, educational achievements, and long-term career success. Awesome, uh, Tosh. Thanks for sharing, sharing that. I think... Um, uh, I, I won't go off script, but I just want to say that I appreciate um, the partnership with Chase and that you all are doing the work to make sure that communities of color, especially Black communities, are positioned for wealth, which is exactly uh, one of our main, uh, the main things we're working on at YWCA Metropolitan Chicago. And so with that, Robert, I'm going to tag you in. Um, if you could talk a little bit about um, your role uh at YWCA Metropolitan Chicago and the work that's happening there to close the racial wealth gap. Sure, thank you, Alexandria, again. And again, thank you, Tosh, for your, your partnership and the leadership that Chase is, is showing. Um, we are mutually aligned in what we're trying to do, uh, which is why we were so glad to have Chase as our partner in this. But the YWCA Metropolitan Chicago, particularly the Economic Empowerment Institute, which is the, the arm of the Y that I oversee, is, is laser focused on trying to close the wealth gap. Um, and what we, our, our overarching mar mantra is that we take individuals from surviving to thriving to catalyzing, uh, taking individuals where we find them in our community from folks that may be homeless to folks who uh, are uh, a little bit uh, closer to stability, who need some uh, educational support and some wraparound services to help them uh, get stable. Uh, to get them to the point where they're uh, very successful and they're they're able to become a catalyst for change, not only in their lives, but uh, changing the communities in which they reside. So the way we do that, as Alexandria alluded to, we have several departments that are part of the Economic Empowerment Institute. Alexandria boldly leads our Financial Inclusion uh, Institute, which includes um, a new organization that we're in the process of acquiring called Partners in Community Building, which provides affordable housing counseling, uh, reverse mortgage counseling, foreclosure counseling. Um, we also have our uh, small business and entrepreneurship uh, center. We're a recognized SBDC, so we provide a myriad of services for folks who are looking to get into business from a side hustle to more experienced entrepreneurs who are looking to grow and scale their businesses. Uh, our Workforce Innovation Institute takes folks from um, uh, needing a resume all the way to uh, needing to develop uh, certifications to get upskilled, to get better, higher paying jobs. And then our Digital uh, Liter uh, Innovation and Technology Institute provides folks with a whole host of computer training skills to help them compete uh, in this economy and or connect our communities um, from a digital uh, literacy standpoint. And then lastly, but certainly not least, there's two other organizations that are part of our uh, financial, I'm sorry, our Economic Empowerment Institute, one being Streetwise, which is a nationally acclaimed uh, social enterprise that teaches folks or takes folks who are homeless or at risk of being homeless and teaching them entrepreneurial skills or providing them with entrepreneurial opportunities by selling the award winning magazine Streetwise to, to customers on uh, within our, our communities. And then World of Money, which is another organization that we just acquired out of New York. 
um, that teaches uh, financial education to youth uh, ages seven through 21, provides phenomenal education um, and opportunities uh, for them to get into business and become entre entrepreneurs and to pitch their business ideas. So those are the levers that we are uh, um, pulling as it relates to our uh, efforts to try to reduce the wealth gap. Thank you for that, Robert. And so in short, um, uh, YWCA Metropolitan Chicago is, we offer programming, what, from seven years old all the way to 65 years old. And, and Robert, you know, not to, not to be tooting our own horn, you know, because I guess that's what I'm doing. But I just want to call out that, um, you know, we're really um, not in addition to our uh, uh, social justice work, right? We believe that economic empowerment of of people of color is part of the social, you know, the social justice movement. And so uh, I think when you think about economic inclusion, I mean, you can walk in uh, as a kid learning about money and walk out of the YWCA as an adult purchasing a home. But in the meantime, you can up level your technology skills and um, you can get a job, right? And so I think that uh, real quick, funny story, when I first started working for YWCA, people were like, can I get a gym membership? I'm like, no, this is not, you know, no. what we do. We are economic empowerment and social justice. And so Robert, thank you for sharing all of, look, all of the things, all the things that we do here at the Y. Um, and so Tosh, I want to, um, I want to come back to you. And so uh, audience, you've heard a little bit about uh, advancing Black Pathways and also the work that YWCA Metropolitan Chicago does uh, in Cook, Will, and DuPage counties, right? But Chase, uh, uh, Tasha, I want you to talk, talk about why um, it's so important that institutions um, get into the work and the conversation about addressing the racial wealth gap. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the biggest challenges for Black people is access to capital. I mean, wealth is capital and their ability to build wealth due to discriminatory practices and the challenges that have existed way before COVID-19 um, means that the Black economic divide is as wide right now as it was in 1968. So between 1983 and 2013, white households actually saw their wealth increase by 14%. But during that same time period, black households saw their wealth decrease by 75%. So this started long before 2020. And in 2016, the typical middle-class black household had something like 13,000 in wealth compared to the typical white household that had about 150,000 in wealth. So in 2016, we would have to combine 11.5 black households just to get the net worth of one white family in the US. In fact, if this trend persists, Amer black Americans are on track to have zero net worth by 2053. And as startling as these numbers are, they demonstrate the need for action right now in addressing the racial wealth gap. So closing the racial wealth gap, it must be a collective effort amongst as many institutions as possible if we really want to affect change. And I think what JP Morgan is doing is trying as much as we can as the nation's largest bank to be part of the leaders of the pack in making sure that we hold ourselves accountable and that we hold as many other corporates and institutions accountable as possible in helping us close this gap and making sure that this ominous 2053 number that we're counting down towards, and to be honest, COVID has probably exacerbated that and brought it forward a little bit, that we do not hit that clock. Wow, Tosh, uh, I, well, wow, right, that's all I can say. And so as a um, practitioner, we know the numbers, right? Um, mm. and they are staggering. And so even though we know these and we study these numbers, it is very hard to hear, right? Um, but I think the thing that sometimes um, we forget as practitioners is that people already know these numbers, right? Because they are living, right? They are the people um, who are, you know, experiencing, uh, and experiencing uh, joblessness, um, underemployment and all these things. And I like to always uh, quote Robert on this. He said that there was a pandemic, there was an economic pandemic before this pandemic, right? And so, as you said, this just exacerbates everything out there. And so I appreciate you saying, you know what, 
we need to come to the table and we need to bring others to and hold them accountable. So thank you for that, Tosh. Um, Robert, um, this is a, a little bit similar to um, what uh, the question that Tosh just answered, but tell me from kind of like our level here in Chicago, um, what are, uh, throw some data our way um, so it's even more real for folks what we're seeing as far as unemployment, joblessness, um, uh, foreclosure rates and all those things we're seeing right now. Yeah, let me add to what Tosh said um, because those statistics were just staggering um, and they're, they're, they're pervasive. So let's, lo let's look at the opportunity as well. Um, so if to build on what Tosh said, back uh, at the end of emancipation, so-called emancipation, black wealth comp uh, comprised approximately 0.05% of wealth in the United States. 2000, in 2020, black wealth comprises about 0.05% of wealth in the United States. So in the last four or 500 years, we have made like literally no progress um, since emancipation. So that's one, one um, staggering sort of uh, statistic. So what is the opportunity? Um, if we were to close the wealth gap, as Tosh said, that would add about $16 trillion to GDP uh, within the United States. Black folks roughly comprise about, spend about $1.4 trillion a year. So we just, uh, that used to be uh, up until this past year, the GDP of Canada. So we were the, uh, we spent as much money as Canada has in terms of its gross domestic product. So there is capital within the community, but to Tasha's point, we need more infusions of capital and do a better job stewarding the capital that we have so that we can grow our businesses and grow our communities. Because what that $16 trillion growth in GDP around the is a US number, but for our for within our community, that, that will raise our GDP by about five trillion dollars as a as a people. But five trillion dollars that puts us like fourth or fifth in line with comp with countries around the world in terms of our ability and our buying power. So how do we get there? That addresses some of the questions that you just asked now in terms of what's happening here in, in Chicago and kind of Unfortunately, Chicago's statistics mirror those nationally. Adult Black unemployment is at 50% right now as a result of the, uh, of the pandemic. Um, we are seeing, um, we haven't gotten the numbers yet in terms of the foreclosure rates because of the moratorium, but the projected um, home loss that we anticipate happening once uh, January hits and the moratorium ends if there's not another stimulus uh, package passed, is upwards of 25 to 30%. The last time that, uh, and back in 2008, when, when the subprime uh, mortgage uh, crisis happened, that was the biggest erosion of black wealth because the majority of black wealth is in home ownership as it is in white communities as well. Two thirds of uh, black folks uh, don't own homes. So if we don't do something to increase home ownership, particularly in light of this pandemic, you will see an even further erosion of black wealth. And that will, to Tasha's point, exacerbate that uh, climb towards negativity by 2053 uh, that she talked about in terms of negative net worth for African-Americans. So we're at a crisis point in terms of uh, everybody getting on the same page in terms of what levers we need to pull to stem the tide and then to grow wealth within our community. Yeah. Thank you for that, Robert. I, I, uh, so I, everything you said, right, and everything Tosh said, and I think probably in addition to access to cop capital institutions stepping up, uh, a, a part of it, and you and and Robert, you already said that Black folks and other people of color, they had the money, right? It's the the spending power, right? And I think that you know, I'll just speak for myself as a young professional working. I didn't really understand my spending power. Um, my siblings and I went to college and so, but we were the first, you know, generation and we started earning and then th we didn't think about spending and saving and all those things and, you know, learned a lot of hard lessons, right? But my point is that we didn't understand our spending power, which makes me think, uh, I didn't understand my spending power, which makes me think of education. And so mm -hmm. if, if Tasha, if you can talk about 
um, what role do you see financial education playing um, in, um, in elevating communities of color uh, financially and also you know, pushing them, I, having them be able to empower themselves to build wealth? Yeah, um, I, I mean, financial education is the foundation of anything. You, you need it to buy a home, you need it to get a credit card, you need it to start a business. And so for us, financial health is a critical component to wealth building. Even just understanding the basic terms, what is income, what is debt, what is a liability, what is an asset, these things create the foundation for long-term economic success and resilience. And it's really what helps us protect our finances so that we're better equipped to handle these economic downturns. Um, it also positions black individuals to leave behind a legacy um, and to make the most of their money. And so that's why financial education has become a key focus for advancing black pathways. We are empowering individuals with the tools they need to be financially successful. So we're doing that for black businesses through something called Advancing Black Entrepreneurs. And we're doing this for, um, we started off with women, but we're expanding in 2021 to all black people through something called Currency Conversations, where we talk about um, how to manage your money, create a financial vision, build a budget, how to build generational wealth. Um, for HBCU students, we've been teaching them about how to navigate their finances as students and the importance of saving even as a student. Um, you know, these are just some of the first steps towards addressing the larger economic challenges that are faced by the Black community. But when one in five Black people do not own a bank account, you know, I think it's Bill Clinton that said, you've got to be in it to win it, right? It's the economy stupid. And we're just not in it. One in five, 21% of Black Americans do not own a bank account. Compare this to only 4% of the rest of America. We have a huge gap to close in terms of making sure that we are financially stable with our savings, with our homes, with our businesses, and it all starts with education. Awesome. Thank you, Tosh. I mean, and, uh, and I'm, I'm looking at some of the, uh, the chats that are coming through. And so somebody said, when you know better, you do better, right? And so, yes, thank you for that. And it's not just knowing, it's the doing, right? It's both. Um, and I think that, the doing. Right, it, it's, right, it's knowing and the doing. And I think that um, just speaking from experience, and I know as a practitioner, uh, I guess I've been in the financial industry, I guess at 20 years at this point, I know I look super young with 20 years, right? But what I would uh, hear from people is that um, financial education was so intimidating, right? Because if you grow up not knowing um, what to do or kind of knowing that you should do differently, but they're not being a pathway or practical tools. Sometimes people just throw their hands up in the air and give up. And so I appreciate that, um, Tosh, you're saying we can help everybody, whether you want to start a business um, and we're even starting at the college level. And so I appreciate you calling that out. And so Robert, I want to tag you back in. We're um, And just everybody, thank you all um, for rocking with us. We have a very good um, amount of uh, attendees today. So thank you all for uh, joining this conversation on why um, financial inclusion matters. And Robert, I'm going to go off script just for one second, because I realize we're talking about financial inclusion, right? It's a word that we toss around a lot at the YWCA. And if you read, you know, some of the um, blogs about the market and things by economists, everybody's talking about financial inclusion. But I want to just take a step back and can you talk about um, what financial inclusion is and, uh, and, and, and related to our work? No, that's a great question. And it builds on what Tosh was just talking about. You know, a lot of when, when I came to the Y a short while ago, you know, the, the name of the department was financial literacy. Um, and a lot of the, the stuff that's out there talks about increasing your financial literacy. And we took a very uh, direct approach because words matter, the language matters. And um, Black people are not financially illiterate. Um, uh, you know, I grew up poor and we uh, did not have these conversations around uh, money. You know, it was usually conversations around the lack thereof and not, not what you do with it once you have it. Uh, but even being uh, of limited means, as they call it, 
Um, uh, I, my mama can make a dollar holla. I mean, she could stretch a dollar farther than anybody I've ever seen. Um, so uh, poor people know how to manage money. It's just that they don't have a lot to manage. Um, and it's, and it's not um, that they're, so it's not that they're illiterate, it's that they've not been included in the opportunities. Like Tosh said, you know, the, the, the percentage of, of African-Americans that are, that are unbanked, you know, we have banking deserts, we have financial deserts within our community. So you couldn't even go to a bank if you wanted to. There was not a bank in my community for me to deposit money if I had any to deposit. So it's more about inclusion. So uh, what we're trying to do is create vehicles and opportunities for folks to be included in the conversation and to be included in the opportunity and the largesse that this country has, has provided and afforded so many others, but has excluded us from. So the notion of financial inclusion is to create a suite of products and services and education that's focused on being inclusive. Uh, a lot of the, uh, to your point earlier, Alexandria, a lot of people just throw their hands up in the air because they hear all of these terms about derivatives and swaps and stocks and all that. I don't know what you're talking about. But there are some basic, simple principles around money. Um, I normally have uh, by, at my uh, desk a book uh, called The Richest Man in Babylon. It is a very simple, short, easy to read book. And it teaches you some very simple principles about money. Um, so from, from our perspective, from a financial inclusion standpoint, we wanna give somebody like pay yourself first is one of the principles from there. It's about savings. So it's a very simple principle that a lot of people don't practice. So before you get into whether or not you're putting in a 401k or in the bank and all of that, you gotta understand and change the mindset of people around basic financial principles that are easy to learn and are not really all scary and demystify what these terms are. And then you can start talking about the products, but you got to meet people where they are and tell them very basic uh, information about what it they need to do to improve their situation. And then you can build upon that, but you got to include people in the conversation. I, I love that. I mean, I, I keep saying I love that, but I love everything, right? You all are uh, you all are right on point. And I think too, Robert, it's also uh, education, but also that um, shifting of the mindset, right? I think even um, calling this series Building Black Wealth says, hey, we can achieve wealth no matter what people say or no matter what the roadblocks or obstacles have been in the past black wealth is attainable and it's and it's within reach and so um i i think about and so some in a, a a later conversation we should have is about the psychology of money right not today but a series about the psychology of money and things like that because it's knowing better and do better but in that knowing it's like you deserve it right um we are working to give people access to the dignified life that they deserve to have sustainable housing, affordable housing, clean housing, businesses, education, and all the things uh, that people have been uh, barred from from so long that they some folks don't even know that it's their right. And so I'll get off my soapbox. I want to- no, no, no. Uh, no, you raise an important <laughs> point about the mindset because I'm, I, I, this just hit me today myself when I was talking, because I'm always talking about the racial wealth gap and the 10X multiple between white wealth and black wealth. So the average, as Tosh said earlier, the average black a white family has a net worth of $171,000 and the average black family has the net average net worth of $17,600. So that's a 10X multiple. But in the grand scheme of it, white people aren't doing that great either because $171,000, and I'm not trying to be elitist, but that's not a whole lot of money in your lifetime. If you work a $10 an hour job and you work until you're 60 years old, you're gonna earn over a million dollars in your lifetime. Now, I don't mean that's how much money you're gonna have when you retire, but you will generate over a million dollars in income. So when you talk about $171,000, and for folks who don't understand what net worth is, is assets minus liabilities. That's less than, a, than the cost of the average median home in, in, in America. So we can close that gap because even though it's a 10X multiple, the number, the, the number 10, the, the, the relative net number of $17,000 is a small number, but so is the number of $171,000. That's not a huge number. So it is possible for us to begin to close that wealth gap if you start doing small things um, like we talked about in terms of paying yourself first. If you save $5 a day 
over six, over 20, 30 years, you can and or put it in a and then put it in an interest bearing um, um, account, um, particularly the stock market. You could potentially close that gap because when they talk about one hundred seventy one thousand dollars, that's for a family. A family in, Amer in America is, is defined as three or four people. So you can we can close that wealth gap if we become more intentional from a mindset perspective in terms of how we're trying to attack that that gap. Yeah, I just want to add to that. It was maybe the prophet Nas, maybe it was the prophet Nipsey Hussle said that it ain't about what you get. It's about what you keep. And I've been seeing a lot of talk about bags in yep. just the black community. And honestly, I have a rule about bags. If I don't have enough money on hand to put in the bag to match the cost of the bag, I cannot buy the bag, okay? If I don't have enough cash to put in that damn bag, right? Yep. Then I can't have the bag. Nothing, you don't need a big empty bag. And like what you were saying, net worth. If you think about your net worth as a bucket, your income is the water coming in. The little hole in the bottom that's never going away is the water going out. That's your expenses. Your net worth is what's left in the bucket. We yep. got to keep more of that in the bucket. We have to keep more of that in our savings. We have to keep more of that in our homes. We've got to make sure that we have something to give to the next generation because each generation is starting with an empty bucket when it comes to the black community. That's why we're going to be at zero at 2053. However, the white community is leaving something in that bucket between their income and their expenses to give to the next generation. So the next generation starting with higher and higher levels of buckets of yep. water in their bucket, and we're starting with zero. And so that's just an easy way to think about net worth is how much we're keeping and passing to the next generation. Yeah. And yeah, I, 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 I feel it. Uh, <laughs> I want to. With that bag, with that I bag. I, 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 <laughs> first of all, I, I love that y'all are keeping it trap, right? <laughs> <laughs> Robert's talking about making dollars holler, and I'm I'm reading the <laughs> chat too. And uh, Tasha's talking about Nipsey Hustle, yes. Yeah, so why financial inclusion matters? Subtitle: Keeping it trap, right? But seriously, <laughs> uh, I love it. And so, just one thing, if I could jump in, because we are almost at time. I could do this with you all all day. But two things before we move on to the final questions. Um, Thank you for that book recommendation, um, Robert. People are loving it. Um, and somebody saying, yes, like uh, we have, uh, as people of color, sometimes we have um, a tendency to be like hood rich, right? And so we want, we don't want to be written And then as people say, rich, no, we rich, 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 not hood rich, we want to be right? rich. Right, but we want to be wealthy um, and, and build general generational wealth. And just one thing, Tosh, I want to say the buckets, right? Uh, you're right. Uh, in our um, in our uh, the executive team for um, our our fin uh, economic inclusion at YWCA, we have our weekly meetings, and we were having a conversation about general generational wealth. Right, this is something we're talking about and we're thinking about. And if you ask us, what keeps us up at night is really making sure that we create pathways. Well, first of all, entry points, pathways, and tools to build generational wealth, right? And so if you think about that in the context of the buckets, right? The way that you fill up that bucket for the next generation is by having life insurance, which we didn't touch on. You know, it's kind of a saying in the black community, like you can't talk about insurance or death because that means you're next, right? No, mm -hmm. I need y'all to get some life insurance because mm -hmm. essentially what you're saying, Tasha, is when, you know, big mama, grandmama dies, mom, dad, whoever, and that bucket is empty that bucket is what you're starting your next generation generation with is nothing right you're we right to start from scratch you know from Absolutely. every generation and so fill your bucket up with some life insurance okay that is one easy way that you build generational wealth and it doesn't have to be you know a very um big policy though not a burial policy it needs to be a little bit more than that get yourself at a minimum some term insurance is super cheap right it's probably the cost that you're paying to get food delivered or you know uh for the for the bags and things you're saving up for so that was my off script moment i just had to say it like in the spirit of keeping it trapped get some like <laughs> it's about to get real trapped now <laughs> <laughs> 
So let, let me build on the, that. The British were grime, actually. Says so oh, okay, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so, but no, uh, Alexander, you raise an important point. It's, it's something that I think going back to this mindset that you know, for I, I see a lot of folks popping off in the chat, and I want to just frame it for people. There's three um, components of wealth building. The first component is acquisition. So when you're young or when you're starting off, whatever stage you're at, you got to begin to acquire wealth. However you do that through your job, your entrepreneurship, your hustle. Right now, um, the government with the stimulus packages are giving their version of 40 acres and a mule. I see people getting these, these PPP loans and they're getting these, these unemployment checks instead of going and standing out in front of the LV and the Gucci store, use that check from the government to begin to acquire your wealth. The second stage of wealth is growth and, or, uh, and uh, uh, preservation. So once you begin to acquire it, now wealth begets wealth. That's what wealthy people know, that once you start making money, it grows. If you, if you, even if you don't, it, it just grows by, by, by compounding. So you don't, even if you don't add to it, it still grows. Wealth begets wealth. But the preservation piece is what you just got through talking about, Alexandra, which is the insurance, because that begets the last component of wealth, which is legacy. So the insurance is there to protect for the eventualities that we know are going to happen. Are going to happen. You're going to die. And there's going to and there's going to be things in life that are unforeseen. That is the purpose of insurance, and that is a vehicle to allow you to pass it on to whatever generation uh, that is to come after you, and whatever generation or whatever cause that you want to uh, have. So those are the three components that everybody needs to understand. And there's different strategies for each stage in your life: acquisition, growth, slash, um, um, uh, pr uh, preserving and then legacy. And then the last piece is understanding the difference between an asset and a liability. What a lot of black folks think their car and their home is an asset, it is not. Those are liabilities. To Tasha's point, if it's not generating you money, then it is a liability. So take again, these government checks, these stimulus checks and stop buying these purses, but instead buy you some real estate, invest it in the stock market, something that is going to generate uh, income or, or produce money because that's what rich people do. They, take, they buy assets that produce uh, income for which then they purchase their toys. And to that point, actually, and we are way off script here. I know, I'm like. <laughs> rich Dad, Poor Dad. I, another, another book recommendation, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm -hmm. Tells you everything you need to know about assets and liabilities. It, it's so important. In fact, home ownership is the world's largest creator of intergenerational wealth transfer. Absolutely. And with the rates that we're owning homes being back at 1945 levels when redlining was permissible, again, nothing to do with the black community and everything to do with some of this predatory lending that wiped out 53% of black wealth in 2008, just through the subprime mortgage crisis because banks were targeting black people with scalpel-like precision they were going to African-American places of worship on Sundays and saying, you get a loan, you get a loan, you get a loan, knowing full well that these loans would blow up in people's faces and devastate communities within five years. And it didn't matter if you got an 800 credit score and you could get a fixed mortgage for 30 years at a great rate, you were still gonna get the loan that blew up in your face. But you fall down seven, get up eight. We mm -hmm. have to make sure that we are able to have something in that asset bucket that our children can liquidate. Now you think about the typical white child, they will have that home and they will sell it 20 years after um, and they'll use it to get married, start a business, pay off their student loans. Having a home that you can pass down to your children to liquidate is one of the greatest ways to generate intergenerational wealth transfer that exists today, land and property and real estate. So just doubling down on what you said, Robert. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. And real quick, because we have like a few, uh, this has been so great. Uh, yeah, I'm just excited, right? Despite, um, you know, we're, we, despite the um, trauma, drama of being in a pandemic, this conversation has brought me, is bringing me joy and giving me life because it's hopeful, right? And so, yes, we know like all the statistics, but there are 
things within uh, our reach that we can do now. And so as we go to our last question, because we are just, somebody said we need more time. No, you can't get more time. But <laughs> but if you come back next month uh, on November 12th, we will be having um, a very similar conversation. So real quick. Um, we talk uh, like this at the Y every I know, day. I know. So Robert, I, I, listen, you were like a... You, <laughs> um, I know that's that that finger, y'all. I'm a mom. Um, but real quick, uh, before we go into this last question, something that came up in the chat was that um, we need to, in addition to everything we're doing, a, a easy step is to normalize having conversations about money, right? And so we have to flex that muscle of learning to talk about money. Um, Rich people talk about money all the time, right? They talk about it on the golf course. They talk about it, you know, on their yacht. They talk about it sitting around the fire, right? All these things. And so people of color need to normalize having conversations about money um, so we can share the information that we have, but also hold each other accountable. And so the last question for you, Tosh, um, uh, what does um, JP Morgan Chase hope to accomplish um, as far as like uh, uh, shortening the racial wealth gap and maybe let's say the next five years. Yes. So, um, and also I want to leave you with a bunch of resources that we can help you get financially um, fit with that we've developed. But um, you may have heard that last week we uh, made a commitment to use um, an additional 30 billion over the next five years to advance racial equity. And so what that looks like is all of J.P. Morgan Chase globally are going to harness our expertise in business, in policies, in philanthropy over the next five years to address the key drivers of the racial wealth gap and divide. So to reduce systemic racism against Black and Latinx people and to support our employees. And so we're going to be doing this by promoting and expanding affordable housing and home ownership, growing minority-owned businesses, improving financial health, and further supporting our employees and increasing our workforce diversity and mobility into senior ranks of Black people. And so just to give you some numbers, and you can hold us accountable to it because we published them, over the next five years, we're going to provide an extra 15,000 loans to small businesses from majority Black and Latinx communities. We're going to originate an additional 40,000 home loan purchase loans for Black and Latinx households. We're going to help an additional 20,000 Black and Latinx households achieve lower mortgage payments through refinancing their loans. And last but not least, we're going to help 1 million more people open low-cost check-ins and savings accounts. Awesome. I know I said a lot. Drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. definitely want to leave you with how to get in touch with us. I'm sure okay. you enjoy some, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, Tosh said, I said what I said. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I said what I said. Right. Because uh, we have like two minutes. Um, if the, uh, the last question was, um, what can regular folks do to begin to begin to build generational wealth? And we talked about that a lot. But if you could just, Robert, just summarize, um, if, if, if the people didn't hear anything, what you said today, and they should have because it was great. But if they didn't, what is the one thing you want them to walk away with? Credit. As Jay-Z said, credit. It's better than uh, throwing up, uh, buying bottles in a club. It's credit. So getting access to capital, it starts with having good credit. So um, in addition to uh, what JP Morgan Chase is doing, one of our focuses is going to be on getting folks access to capital. We're launching our respect card, which will allow folks to get um, a, a prepaid debit card that allow you to begin to build credit by utilizing rent payments um, that allow folks to be, and that'll get reported to the uh, uh, credit bureau so that you can start establishing credit. Uh, where we're launching a similar one for small businesses uh, so that they can begin to uh, build credit aside from based upon their EIN aside from their uh, social security number so that they can begin to develop business credit um, because credit having access to the capital markets is key because if you want to buy a house like Tosh said in order to be able to uh, pass on that intergenerational wealth, you're going to need credit. If you want to apply for a loan uh, to start a business, you're going to need credit. 
So regardless of where you are, we're building products that uh, meet people where they are, um, which is um, at a credit deficit, or if you have great credit, then we have programs to help you uh, figure out how to unlock capital so that you can start a business or buy a home. So credit, credit, credit. Yes, and as we wrap up, I just wanna uh, thank you all for, um, wow, this, this conversation was, uh, it was just amazing. Um, and so as we wrap up, just a couple of things, I just want to thank, I know it's like 1245, it's time to go. Uh, the lights are on at the club. We got to go. So <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to thank uh, Tosh Ernest and JP Morgan Chase um, for partnering with us on this conversation. We are really appreciate um, being able to have your support to do this work. And I want to thank uh, Robert Johnson from YWCA Metropolitan Chicago for his um, expertise and both of you all for the energy you bought. And just a couple of things, if you all have questions about the Advancing Black Pathways offerings at J.P. Morgan Chase, you can send an email um, directly to Tosh and her team. The email address is going to go up in the chat. It's jpmc.advancing.black.pathways at jpmorganchase.com or you can go directly to the website, jpmorganchase.com um, slash ABP for Advancing Black Pathways. Um, our next session is going to be on November 12th, um, which is a Thursday. We, we changed the day because of the holiday. So join us on November 12th. Um, you can register at ywcachicago.org slash building dot black, I'm building hyphen black hyphen wealth or you could click the link in the chat. That's easier to do. Um, and also we want to remind you to follow YWCA Metropolitan Chicago. We are YWCA Chicago. And the last, last thing, right? Um, Tosh and, uh, and Robert gave us so many jewels today. Don't let this day go by without writing like three things down, right? Um, don't, you know, as they would say in the black church, don't leave the same way you came in, right? And so we want you to write down at least three things tonight, um, you know, uh, that you're gonna do um, to, to position yourself and your family towards wealth. And the conversation doesn't end here. If you go to ywcachicago.org, go, uh, go to our website, and if you click economic empowerment, you can sign up for all of our programs that we have for entrepreneurship, financial coaching and housing and so on. And so thank you all so much um, and be well. And we will see you all on November 12th. Thanks for having me. Bye yeah. guys. All right. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Bye. All right.